VIN Future Prize, a new global science and technology prize for humanity from Vietnam. One VIN Future Grand Prize of $3 million. Three additional special VIN Future Prizes valued at $500,000 each. VIN Future Prize honors science and technology work that creates or has a high potential to create meaningful change in the everyday lives of millions of people. Join us to make a change for a better future. Well, greetings from the Vin Future Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the September Innovator webinar titled Smart Transportation and Mobility Solutions for Urban Areas. My name is Tao Chen, and as always, it is a pleasure to be your moderator for today's webinar. But well, we are so delighted to have each and every single one of you joining us in today's event as we hopefully to, untackle, to tackle some of the questions related to the topic and also urbanizations. Now, without further delay, please allow me to introduce to you our panelists for today's webinar. Featured as the chair for today's event is Dr. Patmanaban Anandan, founder of the US-based AI Matters Advisors LLC and chairman of the governing board at Telegana AI Mission, member of the Vin Future Prize Council. Featured as today's distinguished speaker is Professor Alexander Bayan, Liao Chao Professor of Engineering at University of California, Berkeley. He is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science and civil and en en environmental engineering. He is currently the director of the Institute of Transportation Studies. And last, but definitely not least, is our representative of the Vietnamese scientific community, Dr. Lê Nhân Tâm, Chief Technology Officer at the Microsoft Vietnam. Well, before we officially get to meet with our panelists, um, excuse me, uh, we would like to invite you all to keep watch for a short trailer that serves as great materials to ease you in with today's topic. Please take a look. As cities face growing populations and urbanization, issues like traffic congestion, long commutes, noise and pollution have become increasingly problematic. Research by the World Bank in 2022 shows that 56% of the global population already resides in cities, a number set to rise to nearly 70% by 2050. To tackle these challenges and ensure vibrant communities, cities can leverage technology to efficiently manage transportation infrastructure. Excitingly, the Venn Future Foundation is thrilled to announce the latest InnovaTalk webinar, Smart Transportation and Mobility Solutions for Urban Areas, featuring top experts in transport and technology. The webinar will be chaired by Dr. Padmanabhan Ashnandan, a renowned researcher in computer vision and artificial intelligence with more than 60 publications and over 18,000 citations in Google Scholar. Dr. Anandan is currently founder of US-based AI Matters Advisors LLC and chairman of the governing board at Telangana I Mission. His career spans over 30 years in academia and industry in the US and India with research areas including visual motion analysis, video surveillance, and 3D scene modeling from images and video. Featured as the distinguished speaker, Professor Alexandra Bayan from University of California, Berkeley. Professor Bayan is the recipient of the Ball House Award from Stanford University in 2004, of the Career Award from the National Science Foundation in 2009, and he is a NASA Top 10 Innovators on Water Sustainability in 2010. His projects Mobile Century and Mobile Millennium received the 2008 Best of ITS Award for Best Innovative Practice at the ITS World Congress and a Tranny Award from the California Transportation Foundation in 2009. He is also the recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers Award from the White House in 2010. Finally, representing the Vietnamese transport and technology community is Dr. Lear Nunterm, Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft Vietnam. Dr. Tam has many years of experience in the IT field and has held various positions from a researcher to an expert in big tech companies. Before taking up his current position, Tam was the Chief Technology Officer, Lead Architect and Country Technical Manager of IBM in Vietnam. Prior to that, he was a Cloud Advisor and Solution Architect for Information Management of Software Group, IBM in Vietnam. How can smart transportation solutions integrate with other urban planning initiatives, such as sustainable development and environmental conservation? What are the key considerations for cities when implementing smart transportation solutions, such as data privacy and cybersecurity? Discover the answers to these thought-provoking questions at the upcoming September InnovaTalk webinar, Smart Transportation and Mobility Solutions for Urban Areas. 
Well, I would like to remind our audience that our panelists, who possess extensive knowledge and expertise, will try their best to adhere to the allotted time frame for their presentation, which is why we invite you to stay tuned throughout the webinar just to make sure that you can catch up with some very insightful sharings of theirs. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our highly esteemed chair for today's webinar, Dr. Padmananban Anandan a world-renowned scientist in the field of computer vision and AI, with an illustrious career spanning over 30 years in both academia and industry in the United States and India. We are privileged to have Dr. Anadan guide us through the enlightening discussions of today's webinar. Without any further delay, I humbly pass the virtual stage to you, Dr. Anadan. Thank you, and thank you very much, uh, Win Future Prize, for organizing this seminar and all the great work uh, that you are doing. Let me take one minute to talk about my association with Win Future Prize and Win Future Prize, and what I've really seen uh, in the work that's being done across the board in Vietnam and in the Win Group. Uh, you know, Win Future Prize is a prize that Win Group has instituted to award uh, for the best of the best in uh, science and technology innovation. Global prize, uh, the prize amount is three million dollars, which is more than almost any other prize. Very prestigious prize already. You know, some of the great innovators of the world have been awarded in the first two years, and this year is coming up. And beyond that, when I visited Vietnam, I realized how much work in variety of fields is that's being done in, uh, you know, in across the board by Win Group companies in medicine, in AI, but also in uh, cars, Win Fast cars. Very, you know, I actually had a chance to uh, sit in them and uh, take a ride. It's beautiful, and they are going electric. Obviously, it is the future very progressive, uh, forward-looking company, and not surprising that they are organizing a seminar on such an important topic. Now, smart mobility and smart transportation has been a dream for quite a while, maybe two or three decades, but I somehow feel we are reaching a point where things are beginning to shape. And primarily, I think, driven by, in, at least in my humble opinion and limited knowledge, and Alex and others can tell you more, uh, by roughly three factors, the use of sensors everywhere, uh, you know, video sensors on roads, IoT sensors, and a variety of sensors that give a picture of what's going on in the road, uh, you know, global picture. And the second is the intense communication that happens between the cars and the system, if you will. So already, you know, through Google Maps and other things, you know what's going on in terms of uh, transportation congestion, notification by can be sent by transportation authorities. And the last one is actually software that's now controlling various aspects of the car driving. Now you can imagine, you know, these three factors and uh, and many others can really help in uh, making roads, you know, driver driving better, road planning better, reducing congestions, increasing safety, and you know the the limit of this is really uh, endless. And uh, you know, I'm no expert. I'm you know like all of you, just a uh, you know member of the fan club. And uh, Remy, my pleasure to introduce the two speakers. Obviously, you had great introductions in the video. I'm not going to be able to say more than that. But let me just mention, in the case of Alex, um, I don't think the introduction mentioned it, but he has a very diverse career. He's been in aerospace and aeronautics, and uh, you know, now trans smart transportation and cars and such. So clearly, a person who's thought about mobility all his life and uh, has served in the, I think, French military, if I'm not mistaken, Alex. And so he is seen from the inside of the system, outside of the system, and as an engineer, as a scientist, it's a privilege for us to have an opportunity uh, to hear from uh, you know someone like him. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to say Lee Tam, Lee Tam, CTO of Microsoft Vietnam, my own uh, former uh, company where I used to work, and I'm in it really you know my, Vietnam is probably where things are happening, and I'm really delighted. Again, you heard about his role as CTO. And, you know, and his background in driving technology and computing architectures and other things across the world in Vietnam. And I think now what you know he set out to do, hopefully with the presence of companies like Win Group, will make a huge difference in Vietnam. Frankly, I have I was so impressed when I visited Vietnam. It's a in a certain ways it's a young country, certain ways it's an ancient country, but it's uh, really really developed very fast and very open to technology and and you know i hope lee tam you as a you know representative of microsoft will contribute to that leadership i don't want to hold you on hold you off and you are all waiting for the great speakers to come and tell you 
so I will pass. Let me invite uh, Alex to give the uh, first talk and you know the broad topic that you already heard about. I also must apologize for various reasons. I'm in a time zone where I won't be able to stay through the rest of the seminar, but good luck and enjoy the talk. And I will definitely catch up with you all later. And Alex and Lee, I'm looking forward to meeting you sometime in person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Padmanabhan, um, yeah. uh, for the very uh, great uh, introduction and, and very uh, generous introduction. Uh, let me first share my slides to make sure that uh, you all can see my slides. And then I will start uh, one second. So uh, if someone could confirm verbally, because I cannot see you, that yes. you can see my slides. In okay, very good. Thank you. At least I um, can see as a panelist. I hope the audience can see it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much again. So thank you again, Padman for all the generous words. Uh, thank you, Vin Future Price Group, for the uh, invitation. I'm really honored, uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, also, thank you for the very generous video introduction. It's, uh, it's It was very well done. Uh, and for the flawless uh, logistics leading to this beautiful event. Um, it's a very special opportunity for me because uh, my father grew up in Vietnam, but I have never been to Vietnam. I am going to visit Vietnam in December. My uh, good friend and colleague, Laurent El Gawi, the engineering dean in uh, Vin uh, University. Uh, so I'm very excited about the talk tonight because it's for me a little teaser of Vietnam, which I hope to see in three months now uh, during my visit. Um, I was also very excited in your introduction video to see the stop and go waves uh, that you displayed when you talked about traffic. It was beautiful. Uh, that's going to be our topic today. And the last two things I would like to say about um, this talk before starting the, the, the presentation today is that um, Vin, uh, the Vin Group, uh, VinFast and subsidiaries and other uh, branches of the organization um, are of extremely high interest to us because I believe that between your activities in the automotive sector and in the urban space, I really think there are opportunities for Vietnam, uh, especially with the new cities that are being built there. And so I hope that at the end of the talk, it'll be clear that there's a lot of things that I'm presenting that are not implemented in the United States yet, but could be implemented in Vietnam even before. And I really hope that uh, my visit in December will be an opportunity to maybe discuss that with some of you. So today I'm gonna to talk about the Mega Vendor Test, which is a nickname we gave to um, what is to our knowledge today, the largest test ever conducted with self-driving vehicles on a single freeway. We essentially put 100 self-driving cars on a single freeway and use them to control the traffic. And that's the story I'm gonna to tell today. This is joint work done uh, together with a consortium of universities uh, with three automakers, uh, Toyota, Nissan, and GM, um, as well as a lot of different public agencies. So let me start with a simple definition, which is really our future for the next half century. What is mixed autonomy? Mixed autonomy in traffic is a situation in which some vehicles have some degree of automation and interact with vehicles driven by you and me, by humans. So these red vehicles have some level of automation, maybe not fully automated, but some, and you and I are driving cars, so we're just humans. Um, that's gonna be the reality of our life for at least another 50 years. Uh, I, we're, we're probably further away than that from every vehicle being automated, but at least uh, that will keep me occupied for the rest of my life here. Now, one natural question that people would ask about this is, in the world where you have mixed autonomy or full autonomy, um, are things going to get better or worse? And this graph, which I'm showing here, uh, which I took from the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy under the Obama administration, Ruben Sarkar, um, shows from the findings of um, McKinsey and uh, colleagues at UW that um, if we do it right, we could reduce the energy impact of traffic by 60%. And if we do it wrong, we could worsen the impacts of traffic by 200%. Uh, so hopefully we get it right. And hopefully this talk gives a sense of things that can be due to steer it towards doing it right. And maybe doing it right will happen first in Vietnam. So... Uh, the thing is today you're buying a car, it has some self-driving features, maybe some partial features, maybe some form of sophisticated autopilot, et cetera. So it can do things locally by sending things locally. Most likely it cannot talk to other cars. Maybe even it cannot talk to cars of the same brand, but likely it has some form of loose communication, uh, maybe a GSM chip, maybe a 5G or maybe LTE network connection, which is pretty bad. Um, for reliable communication, but good enough to transmit information at a high level. So the question is, given that this is likely going to be our reality for the next 10 or 20 years, not 50, but maybe 10 or 20 years, what can we do with that? 
So it's a good time for me to remember our good friend and colleague, Praveen Varaya, who was the father of this field, one of the fathers of this field, who over 30 years ago started working on that problem and in a well-known 1997 test put for the first time in the history of self-driving vehicles, um, self-driving cars on the freeways. Uh, lots of people think, I know not you, but lots of people think Google invented self-driving vehicles. Actually, I do work at Google uh, also, uh, but it's of course not true. I think um, uh, uh, self-driving vehicles were put on the roads in the 90s at Berkeley and many other places. And there has been a legacy from that. And the legacy um, is a form of uh, architecture which still today is very relevant if we are going to coordinate vehicles, which is there is a network planning layer, there's a link planning layer, there's a coordination layer, there's a regulation layer, um, which is essentially the vehicle, and there's a physical layer of sensors. And all so being able to devise algorithm through that architecture that is now over 25 years old is still not a job that is finished. It's actually very far from being finished. So um, you did show videos that were a lot more uh, colorful than mine, but what you showed in the videos in the introductory is essentially what you see in this video is you probably see some stop and go waves. These cars stop and go and stop and go for no reason because there's no reason for that because we are below capacity. The, the freeway could carry more cars, but somehow it doesn't. And the reason why it doesn't is because you and I and humans in general are very inefficient at controlling vehicles in a coordinated manner that is stable. There are things that humans are very good at and there are things that humans are not very good at. That's one thing people are not very good at. There's no reason why what you see on the left here should happen. So what we did in um, November 2022 is we built a controller structure. And that controller structure um, was a modular architecture we implemented for the first time um, in our um, history at the uh, university, and uh, which we deployed on 100 vehicles of three different types with three different sub-architectures to demonstrate that we could do this coordination even though vehicles could not talk to each other and even though vehicles did not have full autonomy. And so my talk today will walk through that architecture, which at this time probably looks very cryptic to you, but hopefully in 30 minutes will look much more clear. Um, and then we'll show you a little bit of the um, experiments we did. So. Um, at the high level, you have the old uh, planning layer. And at the low level, you have essentially the vehicles that can control um, their trajectories. And what you have to remember is that in between, you have bad phone reception, if you're lucky, because uh, you might also have no phone reception. And so somehow when you're building this architecture where vehicles have to collaborate, you have to integrate into the design of the system all these different specs. So let's start with the old planning layer. Um, this is work done with a few colleagues I'm showing here, Benedetto Piccoli, Alex Keimer, and others. And so at that level, really, what you're looking for is a coordination problem in which you have a leader vehicle. So that's the person in front of the self-driving vehicle. They're doing whatever they're doing. And you can sense it because usually self-driving vehicles have sensors that can measure the speed of the vehicle in front, the distance, and maybe even the acceleration. Then you have a bunch of vehicles in blue, like if you see my mouse moving. And these vehicles, the, the blue vehicles, there's nothing you can do about it. They're driven by humans. You can't sense them much. Um, and then suddenly there's another self-driving vehicle and then other human-driven vehicles. So you can formulate all of this mathematically. And um, the idea is what algorithm should you put on the red cars so that they stabilize and smooth out what's happening in between, which you can't control because it's essentially humans. So you can put mathematical models behind this, which um, we're not gonna go through. Um, the point being is that um, there are equations that can model the behavior of each of these vehicles. And the game is for your vehicle, the red vehicles, the ones you can partially control to find the right set of controls that achieve the greater good. It's important to also realize that there is a lot of mathematics in that work. Um, because these models, they're built by engineers like us, but it's important to understand that um, if you're computing solutions to these uh, controls, you need to also be able to demonstrate that these solutions um, um, uh, exist and that they have specific properties that you need for uh, the system to work. So with that, you essentially can demonstrate things such as if you're going to use that algorithm, then acceleration is going to be bounded or acceleration is going to be between certain bounds. 
Um, so I'm not expecting that you're going to read through these equations, but more that you're going to realize that um, it's not just a code we're writing, it's really a mathematical theorem we're proving that will demonstrate some properties that later will live in the code. Um, and so um, with that, what you're doing is you're essentially uh, m minimizing a cost function. And that cost function here, for example, it's not how much you want to do better for yourself. Of course, that matters. And that is part of the cost function. But it's also the impact you have on the other vehicles. And that's very important because the idea is that if you're going to stop these waves, you should really be able to um, uh, take into account the model of the people you have in the back of you, even though you can't see them, you have a model of how they behave and that should be optimized in that cost function. So what we proved in that consider in that specific case was that this problem has a solution. We managed to characterize it and then we devised ways to build a solver to compute that solution in real time. And that's what lives at that upper layer of the system. And there's plenty of ways to do that uh, that can be used, uh, many of which I'm sure your engineers have, have, um, have um, uh, used over the past. And in our case, what we found was really helpful is to use the adjoint based optimization method, which is a very uh, efficient method for that. And I'm going to skip that, but again, there's a bunch of equations that can uh, be used to to, mon to model that. So then um, I think uh, what's important to realize is that um, before you even move anything to the field, um, what you need to do is to demonstrate in simulation that the results uh, you're providing will be able to uh, improve things. So you're going to see a lot of these diagrams, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that view graph to explain how they read them. What you see in the horizontal axis is the time, and what you see in the vertical axis is the position. And the color indicates the speed, so you can assume that if things are green, you're going reasonably fast, and if things are uh, dark, then you're going reasonably slow. And what you can see is the first trajectory on the left here, uh, of the left picture, the top trajectory, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but I'm moving it over the first trajectory, suddenly breaks and then accelerate and then breaks and accelerate, et cetera. And that um, trajectory essentially generates these waves that propagate backwards. So what you see here is green, followed by dark, followed by green, followed by dark, followed by green, et cetera. And that's bad because that's where you burn all your fuel. Or if you're running an electric vehicle, like the VIN uh, fast vehicles, that's uh, even though you have regenerative braking, braking, every time you accelerate, that's where you burn your energy. So the idea is that if you're going to spread self-driving vehicles throughout uh, the flow of traffic, you are. it's better to be orange all the way than to be green and black and green and black. And that's exactly what these algorithms do. So the previous equations I showed you were pr probably pretty cryptic. But what they do is they analyze the first trajectory on the left the person in the front, and they manage to somehow smooth out what's happening in the back of them. And what we were able to demonstrate with that is that that induces an improvement of up to 24% in energy. Um, there are other ways to do that. You can do that with uh, optimal control. You can, and in, in fact, some of the contributions we did was demonstrating that some of the um, uh, formulations we have um, uh, can be reduced to quadratic programs uh, which are linearly constrained, and that can be solved very efficiently. So the idea is that the models can be tweaked in some ways that the formulation of the underlying problem become much faster to solve. And that's what goes into these planning layers. Okay, so now, so this explains to you essentially how we do that planning. Now, um, there is also a question of data. And um, if you're in Vietnam, or if you're in most of the countries in the world, um, there is not much uh, infrastructure to measure the situation of traffic. So you have to rely on data that usually you can buy from third parties. And the typical third parties that we would work with are Inrix or, or similar uh, companies. And these companies, essentially, they have subcontracted a lot of fleet vehicles. Uh, think about your postal service. Uh, think about your delivery fleets. Think about a bunch of fleets. And these fleets, they sample your freeways and they provide pictures of the traffic on these freeways at given times. This is very crappy data in general because it's very poorly sampled, but that's what you have to work with. There's no choice here. So the idea is that the algorithms I've shown before, 
need to be able to work with very crappy data because crappy data is what you get. There's no other way. And to show you how crappy the data is, it's also really good data, but it's also really crappy. There, but to show you that it's both, uh, this is again time, and this is again space, and you, the color code is the same. So you can see it's very coarse. Each of the cells of the data is about 500 meters. So that means you're getting one data point every 500 meters every minute. And usually that point is five minutes delayed because of the system. But so it's, it's not great, but it's good enough that you can see these waves. They're not very granular, but you can see them. So the whole um, philosophy of what we're doing consists in being able to devise the algorithms I've just shown you and make them work on that really bad data. And that data is bad enough, but it's good enough that you can actually see the waves. So if you do some simple filtering, you can see on the right, here's a bottleneck, that's the big uh, white line on the, on the right uh, picture. And here are the waves, the kind of uh, parallel zebra lines on the picture. Uh, and from these features that you can extract with simple machine vision algorithms, uh, now you know what you're dealing with. A bottleneck means within maybe half a kilometer, your car is going to come to a stop. So if you want to optimize energy, you should slow down progressively. Waves means, like on the right, you're going to stop and go and stop and go. So what you should do there is try to go at an average speed. I'm narrating here what the algorithm is doing, but you can see that with simple machine vision techniques, you can extract these features. And if you feed these features inside our algorithms, then you can make the algorithm work. Okay, so now you are going to use a very bad network to transmit that to the vehicles. Because if you have done any work in uh, cell phone uh, technology, you know that uh, the cellular network is not a good network to pass reliably high bandwidth, low latency messages um, in a systematic manner. It's actually the opposite. So what that means is that uh, imagine you have the, in California, you have the latest Teslas or in uh, uh, Vietnam, you have the latest VinFast um, and they all have a GSM chip Right now with the cell phone infrastructure, and maybe it will change when 5G arrives, but it's not here yet, at least not in California. The best you can do is you can send maybe some low volume traffic information to a lot of cars, and maybe the cars can feed a little bit of data back, and that data could be exchanged at a higher level and maybe fed back to the cars. That's really the reality of you have to deal with. So the question is, how do you devise a coordination algorithm that can do that? so that the vehicles, even though they cannot talk to each other, can collaboratively work together. Um, and so this is roughly the way that stuff works. Um, you um, are able to use a set of guidelines that will essentially tell the vehicles that they have to balance between a target speed, that's the left, which makes sense, right? You know that on average, your freeway is going 40 miles an hour. So you give them a target speed of 40 miles an hour. Some form of regulation, because you should not accelerate too fast and you should not follow the person in front of you too close. And some safety, because if there's something really bad, like someone does a lane cut, you should stop. So, so this, is some, this equation, you can read it that way. You don't need to look at the symbols, but you can read it that way. And that's somehow of an information you can pass through the network. So the question is first, well, how do you determine the target speed? And it turns out that there is heuristic methods to do that, which are very intuitive, which is if you're far from a vehicle, you should start a catch up with the vehicle. But if you're getting too close to the vehicle, you should stop catching up. So I'm again, narrating what that equation says, something very simple heuristic, um, but which if you apply properly with a proper parameter tuning will essentially do the opposite of what the human is doing. I mean, think about like you're stuck on the freeway. The first thing you want to do is to go as fast as possible to catch the person in front of you so that nobody passes you. That's the natural thing a human wants to do. What this algorithm does is similar, but not quite as aggressively so that it does not amplify the instabilities. Because when you do what I just told you, that's when these waves happen. And you saw them in your video and you saw them in my video. And so there is a, an interesting question about what is that desired speed? And so to achieve that desired speed, you use what's called the kernel method. And what the kernel method does is it looks at that higher level, at the information it has, that not so good quality information, and somehow it manages to smooth it out. So again, you don't need to look at that equation for its detail, but what you should know is that what that equation does is it prescribes you a speed, which is a form of average of what's around you. 
so that you don't do something that is too different from what's around you. Because that's the, that's the philosophy of how you smooth traffic. And you can see the way it looks like here. Um, essentially, uh, the, 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 the true information you get, that's the yellow curve. So the yellow curve, it has like, you know, ups and downs and ups and downs. And the green curve, it does look like a smooth version of the yellow curve with some form of time shift, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. And you can imagine that, you know, if you were um, thinking as a thought experiment that you're riding a train that is on the yellow curve, it's going to be a pretty bumpy ride. But if you're riding on the green curve, it's going to be a much smoother ride. Um, and so uh, the picture you see on the right here are the people who came up with that algorithm that we implemented in the vehicles. Um, and so th th now this is what we call an expert controller. The expert controller is something that was derived somehow from heuristics. Uh, we put some mathematical formulas uh, to model it. And when we could, we proved some properties. Um, the problem is that expert controllers like these ones, they do have limitations. In particular, they do require the knowledge of some parameters that we might not have on the road. So we used imitation controllers, imitation learning controllers, which are controllers that start to imitate a libraries of expert controllers derived by humans, and then they improve them on the basis of other data they have. So the expert controller development is the first stage, and then you pass it to ML, and then ML uses that in imitation learning to make it better. Okay, now that also needs to be able to function if you have no communication, and that happens. There's plenty of places in California where you lose cell phone connectivity, so some ways, the algorithms are, should be able to function even if they don't have connectivity. So for that, um, what you do is you train um, the imitation learning to operate using a series of scenarios it has seen before so that in the event when no information is passed to it, it still can recognize what's happening. And I'm just again narrating what the imitation learning is doing here so that it can operate even in absence of communication. Now, it, the performance will degrade. There's no free lunch, but it will still be able to operate fairly well. OK, so now what happens in the vehicles? That's a very interesting question. Th these, uh, these pink arrows here, what they do is they pass information to the vehicles. And if you go to the dealership, like we did, uh, when we started this work, we bought a bunch of cars. Uh, we bought Toyota RAV4s, we bought Nissan Rogues, we bought uh, GM XT5. XT5. Um, they all have different architectures. Um, some, not most of them, they have enough sensing to sense lean changes, to sense things in the front, sometimes to send things in the back. But the fact that the vehicle can see it does not mean that we can see it. If you open the hood of a RAV4 2021, and you know the right port, you might be able to see the headway, the acceleration, the speed of the vehicle in the front. But if you do the same with the Rogue 2022, even though the ACC of the Rogue can do it, we can't do it. So the algorithms that run under the hood had to take that into account. For example, in the XT5, depending on the mode you operate, you cannot sense and actuate at the same time. So that's something you have to deal with. And so to do that, we used reinforcement learning. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we do in reinforcement learning. So most of you probably have heard of reinforcement learning before. Uh, you can view this as a form of um, an optimal control problem where at every step you prescribe some action, which gets a scoring. That's the reward and the state. And the state feeds back some information to the agents. So I'm going to explain a little bit of how this works and how we train the algorithm. So in the next uh, 10 or 15 slides, you'll see red, blue, and white cars. Red means essentially a vehicle with some automation. Blue means a vehicle that the red vehicle can sense. If you're in the front, if you're on the side, if you're behind, maybe there's a sensor. But a white vehicle is not something you can sense. It's somewhere here, but you can't sense it because it, you're too far away. And so now the environment is an interesting thing. If, when you do this reinforcement learning business, you essentially have to teach the algorithm to handle the uncertainty. And so for that, you have to use a model. And so the types of models we're using, which we hope to be able to deploy at some point, one day in Vietnam, maybe in collaboration uh, with you, in, if we deploy that technology here, are very highly calibrated models that can uh, model the trajectory of each of the vehicles very precisely um, in, 
inside the engine as well, like how much energy is burned, et cetera, the vehicle class, whether it's a truck, a bus, et cetera. Um, and the architecture we built um, is um, able to use both commercial products like Amazon Online or uh, open source software like Sumo. And when we launched that uh, product in, 19, in 2017 or that, um, um, uh, I guess, research project, uh, we this was the first time in the history of transportation engineering that micro simulation, like I've shown before, was interfaced with RL. So the state of the art libraries at the time were RL Lib and RL Lab on the cloud, which at the time was AWS. In fact, Siemens built their first cloud version of Imson for us, uh, and this was announced at TRB. So this this had this had never been done before. And there's a reason is like 10 years earlier, you couldn't run it reliably. There was no data. It was really hard. Uh, but somehow um, uh, all of that had disappeared. So I'm going to show you a little bit of historical um, description of, of uh, why um, and how. In 1935, um, a, name, a guy named Bruce Greenshield was the first person to measure a traffic jam uh, and, and built a model for it in, in, uh, in Ohio. Um, many years later, Sugiyama in Japan realized this experiment that you see here. In this experiment, he essentially asked humans to drive and keep their distances. And if you watch that video long enough, and that, vi that video has gone viral over YouTube for many years, you can see that in 30 seconds, it's a disaster. Like people just stop and go and stop and go. That's because I was mentioning before, humans are not good at doing that. Now, fast forward 10 years, this team of collaborators redid the same experiment in Arizona. So you can see they're uh, essentially, again, pretty bad and oscillating. And they inserted a self-driving vehicle, which right now is just driven by a human. That's the vehicle with an arrow. But in about 10 seconds, it, the arrow is going to turn red. And when the arrow turns red, which it just did, then the autopilot sets in. And within a few seconds, it kills the oscillations. That experiment was a revelation for them because that demonstrated that with one vehicle, you can stabilize a ring of 20 vehicles and save 40% of energy, 40% of energy. So when, when, when we realized that, we realized, okay, this technology is ready to go to the field, except there was another interesting part and the former student of mine who is now a faculty at uh, MIT managed to recreate the exact same situation in simulation. So you can see the exact same instability happening. And when the red car is going to cross the line, it's going to stabilize the ring. So you're probably wondering, well, if this was done on the field in 2017, why am I showing you something which is similar that was done in Numerix in 2018? And the reason why I'm telling you this is because this was done without any model. This is deep reinforcement learning using black box simulation to learn. And it does exactly as well as essentially 80 years of research leading to a model and a controller. And when we realized that, we figured that this was a pivotal moment in the history of mixed autonomy because that means you could train deep reinforcement learning algorithms to control things that at least as well as humans had done. And it's interesting because in terms of the, uh, you know, if you think about it, there's probably 10,000 articles that have been written since that very first 1935 paper. Once they did the ring experiment, there was another 1,000 articles. And then one student managed to redo it without any model with one article. And that's kind of uh, is exemplary of the acceleration of research, if you will, in this field. And so when we realized that, we realized, okay, so this could probably be generalized a lot. So this is an example of what you do if you have now two rings um, and you launch the exact same algorithm on these two rings. And what, it's funny because it learns to behave like a jerk, essentially. It prevents people from passing fast enough um, and it stabilizes the two rings. So you could say, well, in some ways, what it did is it just learned to be a police officer doing a snail operation. But it's cool because it learned it without knowing um, what that means. So... Another thing that then you can see now where I'm going with this, we're going to do more and more difficult situations. This is the worst possible way of managing an intersection. Okay, like everybody stops. So if you launch the algorithm here, what it does is it learns to essentially drive at the exact speed to create a snake of the exact length of half of that eight figure so that it maximizes the throughput. And again, it has no model of vehicles. All it has is access to a black box that it can simulate with the improved form of learning. Um, 
And then in situations like this, where now you're trying to maximize the throughput of that merge point, where um, again, very inefficient, um, what you can see it's doing is actually, I cannot tell you what it's doing, but it's doing better than the humans are doing. But if I invented a story to tell you what it's doing, I, I, I would be essentially inventing a story. It somehow found a solution that the human could not find by retaining some vehicles at some point, releasing at some other point, and somehow beating um, the, 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 the human. The other interesting spectacular things is transfer learning. What if you learn on the ring and you deploy on the road? So this is an example of a road merge. Uh, and this is how shock waves are created. And that road merge, every time a vehicle is injected, it creates a back propagating wave. And that back propagating wave creates inefficiency, okay? Now, if you take the car that was trained on the ring and you inject them on this, that's what you get. So I'm gonna replay you the video now, but this time, every once in a while, there's a red car and the red car sees the other red cars in the front through some bad network. And somehow, if you watch the next red car right now, what does it do? It just stops because it figured that if it stops now and accelerates slowly, it's gonna be better for energy because right at the end, it's gonna catch with the other vehicle. And that's not something it learned here because it's never been here before. It learned it in the, in the circle. So it's a form of transfer learning of a situation learned in one context and deployed in another context. And you look at the trajectories, it makes perfect sense. Instead of going through these waves that you see here on the left, it waits on the right, creates a gap and reconnects to the platoon exactly when it needs to. So it doesn't forward the, the instabilities forward. So when we realize this, um, we asked ourselves the natural questions, like how many of these vehicles do you need to make it work? Um, and we figured that with maybe 10% of the vehicles, well, that could work. And then we could smooth waves. And that was the beginning of our project. So we also tried a bunch of other things, like could you selectively hold vehicles in some form of bottleneck to make things better? That might be of interest to future urban planners. Like uh, there will be a day when you don't need traffic lights anymore because vehicles are doing it themselves. And that is maybe the way it would look like. And of course, if you live in California, what you're thinking is the Bay Bridge because the Bay Bridge is still doing ramp metering in the way I'm showing here. And so we're thinking of seeing how this can be applied in such settings. And needless to say, that's really hard and we're not there yet. Okay, so we released that framework. You can download it, uh, it's, it's, it's free. And so then the question is, now that we had this, could we deploy it in the field? Before we went to the field, we started to move it to hardware platforms. So this is one of my students, uh, Feng Yu Wu and uh, Eugene Vinitsky, who is a professor at uh, NYU. And so first we deployed a bunch of uh, ex experiments to show that what you learn in software, you can deploy in hardware. Before you put it on people's vehicle, you should put it on small models. Uh, this is another example we did with the University of Delaware, where um, on the left, you see a baseline scenario. The blue vehicles are doing nothing. On the right, this is the same blue vehicles, except they're managing the traffic. And if you watch the right video, the last vehicle, the Hummer, will exit as early as we can, which is a bit earlier than on the left. If you watch the last vehicle on the left, by the time the right video has the last vehicle exit right now, there's still vehicles on the left. So this is an example of um, scheduling that you can do with these algorithms as well. And again, you learn it in software and you deploy it in hardware. So as we were progressing now, we're like, okay, so we did the, they did this car experiment in 2016. They did a few more vehicles. So then in 2021, we did a 10 car experiment. And last year we did a 100 car experiment. And I'm gonna tell you about that in the last 10 minutes of this talk. So I'm gonna um, skip this for now because we might not really have the time. Um, but um, maybe one thing I would like to show you is um, this. So um, there's a really interesting property um, is that if you if you train experts um, at a given speed on the freeway, so a car that will be the expert at driving at uh, two meters per second, three meters per second, four meters per second, et cetera, you get a bunch of cu curves that are optimal at these values, the green curves. And then what we did with machine learning is we, it, we, we were able to replicate that, but without the knowledge of that speed. And so that was very important because what that means is that in simulation, we trained the reinforcement learning controllers on enough scenarios that at the end, even if you removed some of the parameters needed for the algorithm to work, such as the knowledge of the speed downstream, the algorithms were still able to function without them. And that was really interesting because that was the opening of a new 
era for us where we didn't we did not need to have as much sensing. And to do that, we were using some form of reinforcement learning where the reward function was a combination of energy as well as the combination of variance reduction and knowledge of the downstream condition. Okay, so um, of course the problem is that um, as we were implementing this, we realized that in some vehicles, you can't actually actuate with acceleration. So we had to retrain the algorithm to overrule the, air, the cruise controller so that essentially it would learn to actuate through the cruise controller in order to achieve the same outcomes. And that was an interesting thing where you don't have control over the actuation, but you gain control over something that can achieve targets and you learn indirectly that way. Okay, so then now the time was to go to the field. So my colleague Dan Work um, erected a 15 million test bed in Nashville, Tennessee on I-24 by building a full test bed to measure what we would be doing. And of course the test bed is gonna be used way beyond us, but we were the first experiment. So what you see is now a bunch of cranes building um, poles. And as these poles are erected, um, video cameras are installed on top of it every 500 meters. And that is now the largest test bed in the world um, to measure traffic uh, on the freeways. Um, this is the highest resolution data there is. It's completely crazy. We con we um, collected a lot of it in um, uh, December of last year, and we're not even finished analyzing the first batch of data, given how rich the data is. Okay. So um, then we had to build these 100 uh, car demo. So we um, rented a factory and then we brought in 50 students from a bunch of universities. And then we hired 150 drivers uh, because at the end, when we did run the test, we needed to have 150 drivers um, uh, that at some point give the control to the vehicle, but um, in regular condition would still drive the things. Um, then we built, uh, we, then we got 100 cars from the factory, from Nissan. Um, and then we built radios and a bunch of equipment to put in each of the vehicles um, so that the vehicles would be able to receive our commands. Um, we installed our own internet um, uh, tower uh, here so that we could ship the algorithms in real time to all the vehicles. So what you see here is a, a downtime where all the vehicles, the 100 vehicles, there's vehicles all around us are open. We fix things. And as we fix things, we also ship the new controllers and we kept shipping new controllers. So um, uh, that means you have to teach all the students to essentially go in the car, open the car, figure out the port and, and, and so on. So this one is done, for example, on the Rogue, uh, on the Nissan Rogue. Um, and then every day we would test new things um, with our colleagues. Uh, and then um, uh, at the end, when the algorithms were tested, we would ship them. And then what you see here is a form of controller on the left where you can see, see it's, it's almost like you're pushing software over the air to vehicles and then it turns green when the software is uploaded onto the vehicles. Uh, then we went to recruit all these 150 drivers because you have to pay people to do it. So that was kind of an interesting uh, thing here. We would train the drivers um, every day. Uh, they would come in the morning at uh, 4 a.m., um, we would launch them on the road at uh, 5.30 a.m. So they would catch the morning congestion. And then they would go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to, to essentially um, smooth the traffic. Um, they were given breaks, et cetera. And then now this is an interesting part. This is, okay, so if you're in the car and if you're running our algorithm, what do you do and what do you see? And the whole thing was done in a way that you would not be able to see the difference between a regular ACC. So when we trained them, we said, okay, you, you see the little onion button here? Just push it as if you were pushing the adaptive course control, but be aware that it's not gonna do adaptive control, course control. It's gonna do something very different. And if you feel it's weird, okay, disengage. Um, and most of the people didn't feel it was weird. They feel it was different. It's not your typical cruise controller. It, it behaves smoother in some places. It catches up maybe a bit faster in some other places. Um, but at the end of the day, um, uh, it doesn't feel any different than uh, than it would uh, with, a, with a regular controller. Um, so we trained them to do that. They had a full day to get trained. And then essentially we launched them uh, on the road. So they, each of them received a QR code and the QR code told them which route to drive. So they would drive from our headquarters with a pin and then go up and down and up and down and up and down. And now you have to imagine you have 100 vehicles on this uh, five kilometers or five miles of freeway, forget if it's five miles or kilometers, and they're circling back and forth, which means essentially 
it's one or two percent of traffic is our vehicles, and one and two percent is roughly enough to control everything which is happening around you. I mean, you can control everything like you would in a military parade, but you can control enough that you can smooth traffic. And Sean is the one who uh, came up with uh, with a scenario. So we launched that. We had a pretty big um, uh, monitoring uh, system to do that. Um, and then, so the vehicle we were doing is we had 100 Nissan Rogues, we had five Toyota RAV4s, and we had one Cadillac XT5, and we run all of them at the same time. So we run the parking lot almost like an airport operation every day, um, launching the cars um, all in the morning. Uh, this is an example of what the parking lot looks like over the course of the day. Uh, so you can see the drivers coming in, the cars going into the freeway, and then essentially smoothing the traffic back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, we would uh, collect the data and then uh, see uh, how successful we had been. Uh, so we run that uh, for a full week. I mean, obviously, it was months of preparation before we could do it. Um, and this generated the largest test uh, data there is in the world on mixed autonomy traffic on that freeway. Um, once you're on the freeway, OK, it's mildly exciting because at the end, that's a freeway. So you're not going to see some action like in uh, Mission Impossible or anything. Um, but um, this video set here gives you a sense of what that freeway looks like at a very peaceful time. I mean, I have seen people walking on that freeway. Um, every time I've driven that freeway, there's a different accident. I mean, this is a crazy freeway. Uh, that part here is pretty mellow. Um, and, but the point is that um, this gives you a sense of um, every probably minute there was a car being injected. And cumulatively, because they were turning, there was probably enough vehicles to smooth the whole traffic. Now, stop and go waves still happen. Um, and we're still not finished um, uh, examining the data, but we already have seen that we did improve traffic greatly with this. Um, so we did run a full press conference when we were doing it. We had a, we were on a, a few hundred media outlets. Um, and um, um, uh, as we were doing it, uh, we also had uh, this largest uh, monitoring system in the world, actually. Uh, we could see everything happening on every freeway. And you have to see that if you do any machine vision, um, every window here is something we have in high res from which we can extract high value trajectories. Um, and this um, diagram here shows you all the trajectories. So you can see the waves. This was before we launched the algorithm. So you can see these waves. You can see the trajectories go, going like this. And every time they go slowly, it's red. And you can see this big zebra uh, bands. And these are the waves we're trying to, to, to smooth. Um, we are in the process of uh, extracting the energy information from all the vehicles, not just ours, through the uh, video camera network. And we're not finished. So today I will not be able to show you our final results. Um, but things I want to show you which are interesting, which we can measure, are, 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 are here. Uh, and I know I have about four minutes to finish, and I'm almost done. Um, so this is the savings of energy uh, in the bottom left. And what you can see is that the self-driving vehicle saves 16% energy by just smoothing the waves. So already, if you're doing this with your car, you spend 16% less energy. But what's interesting is that the vehicles behind, which are not automated, they're just regular people, because they have to drive with you in front of them, they have to behave in a similar manner because they can't pass you, and they are also saving energy. So the second person who, do who doesn't even know what's happening, he's saving 14% energy. The third person saves about 13% energy, the fourth person saves about 10% energy. So in some ways, people sometimes don't even realize we're doing this, but they're actually saving energy too, thanks to what we're doing. And they don't even understand they're doing it. Um, so it did feel a little bit like uh, bringing a big gang together. And that's why I put all my favorite movies here to show you a little bit what it was, because uh, it was kind of an unusual experiment to do that. And this is the whole team that, that participated to it. Um, I cannot show you the results today because the results are still confidential. Um, we will be able to disclose the results in probably three months. We are still doing a lot of uh, review work for that. Uh, the one thing I can show you is this result, which I have shown here, which is actual data. Um, imagine that we will have something like this uh, for 100 of our vehicles uh, surrounded by thousands of the other vehicles. Um, and again, the data to this day is still confidential. Uh, which is why we can't talk about it in public, but probably in one year, or maybe even when I come to Vietnam, we will be able to disclose some. Uh, and by then we should have the most of the results for all the vehicles. So I think we're finishing a bit ahead of schedule with three minutes uh, ahead time. Um, but I want to acknowledge really all the people who have collaborated to this work. 
um, the National Science Foundation, of course, and the U.S. Department of Energy, the automakers. Um, and the one thing maybe I want to give uh, as a takeaway message is that um, in the U.S. today, um, most of the vehicle manufacturing companies that are automating vehicles are not thinking at this point actively and um, uh, with a lot of resources to how you coordinate vehicles over these lossy networks. Because if you're selling a product, it's not the point. Um, but the one thing which is unique in Vietnam and which is also maybe true in some places in the Middle East is that if you're developing new cities and in particular, if you're thinking about the integration of OEMs and vehicles in the new urban space, there is a true opportunity um, to do it right. And by that, I mean, to be able to um, devise algorithms such that when you deploy a new vehicle in uh, these cities, if these vehicles all are running some similar type of algorithm, um, there is a chance that not only you're improving the experience for the driver, but you're also improving the experience for the entire city, or at least the places where you're deploying the technology, because it actually is doing some form of coordination that you would not have done had you not uh, tried to optimize a greater objective function than just the quality of the ride. And that's really where we came in from. Um, so hopefully there will be an upper, another opportunity to show you the final results. Today was in some ways just a teaser. I've shown you what we have done uh, and maybe in another t talk, I will be able to show you what we have achieved um, with real numbers. Thank you. Well, Professor Bayan, we could only imagine the amount of time and efforts that you invest in such a highly detailed presentation. And for that reason, we thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. And coming up next, following right after Professor Alexander Bayan, is actually our representative of the Vietnamese scientific community, Dr. Linh Nhan Tâm, Chief Technology Officer at Microsoft Vietnam. Dr. Tum has many years of experience in the IT field and has held various positions from a researcher to an expert in big tech companies. Before taking up his current position, Dr. Tum was actually the chief technology officer, lead architect and country technical manager of IBM in Vietnam. And for that reason, we are very excited to have Dr. Linh Nhan Tum joining us. Uh, may I please invite Dr. Linh Nhan Tum to the virtual stage, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh First of all, I would like to thank uh, We Future Pride organizer for inviting uh, Microsoft and me to uh, to join the webinar. It's a, a very honor for me uh, to to join the webinar. This is a very interesting topic. So um, I would like to say in in like uh, ten minutes, I would like to share with you a very short presentation. That's uh, I mean from industry view in terms of how we uh, we are working in in, in smart mobility uh, problem. Yeah. Let me share my screen. So. Uh, Everybody can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. So on um, there's a, a survey report from uh, PwC about you know uh, they they survey we leader in terms of trending uh, of smart mobility uh, transformation. So um, the response from leader they uh, recognize us uh, near ninety percent of leader they are considering the digital transformation and uh, uh, advanced technology is a high gig priority in in the transformation of smart mobility in next several year. So this is a very you know uh, aligned with what is happening now in terms of digital digital transformation and four point zero industry revolution. Right. So. Um, uh, See, last several years when we talk a lot about uh, 4.0 industry revolution and so digital transformation, there are some you know key digital disruptor. That's the uh, we are uh, talking a lot about you know the big data and the cloud, IoT, and so the artificial intelligence, right? So in terms of you know smart mobility, there are some key disruptor that uh, they are defining the future. I mean the future of uh, smart mobility, that right? like uh, autonomous driving. Um, connected with hiker and also you know smart city and uh, smart I mean um, intelligent operation center for smart city and also you know, some of new business model um, now in terms of transportation right like you know uh, ride sharing like Uber like Grab and and also the uh, with you know the uh, development of of uh, uh, smartphone uh, technology so everybody uh, can have their own you know mini computer on on their smartphone right and so many kind you know the um, application smart application on on their smartphone and so the with the um, uh, developing of you know the cloud computing and 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 iot so they can bring the some kind of you know uh, uh, data and ai community to the s i mean to the uh, end user device 
to run some kind of smart application. And um, because of you know people, um, they have their own smart uh, mobile phone like like you know a mini computer. So the so the the data, I mean, we can collect data, and so some of you know data infrastructure. Uh, it should be you know uh, change the game. That Professor Alec already mentioned about you know how uh, how data uh, play a role in in smart mobility. And uh, based on based on that kind you know uh, digital disruptor, so we can implement for many kind you know solution uh, for smart transportation. But actually, in terms of you know implementation of smart uh, um, transportation solution, is not not really easy. Not really easy. Uh, there are some you know barrier and so challenge in terms of uh, um, successful implementation of smart mobility, right? Uh, like, you know, uh, in Vietnam and some other de 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 developing country, we are facing with some challenge, like, you know, the alignment between, you know, uh, national strategy policy and also, you know, the city and province and, and in, 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 in a different area. I mean, uh, in, in terms of, you know, the infrastructure um, alignment uh, between, you know, the uh, investment plan, budget planning, and also, uh, uh, and also, you know, the uh, policy of, of different provinces. Also. And uh, sometimes uh, we we are facing a challenge of uh, citizen uh, uh, expectation, and also, uh, and so, um, different, you know, maturity level of different, you know, province and city and uh, region. It could be affected, you know, the, the successful of of uh, implementation, also. and um, and also, you know. Uh, regulation because of um, many new business model like uh, uh, ride sharing, uh, like Uber, Grab. So the government they have to adapt and also to create, uh, to uh, I mean to adjust policy and regulation to uh, to utilize new technology and to support the new business model like you know uh, ride sharing, for example, right. So to uh, implement successful of uh, smart uh, mobility uh, solution, it should be you know uh, combined. Um, uh, I mean, so many uh, kind of, you know, stakeholder from government, from, you know, uh, province, city, and from uh, enterprise, and also from citizen also. Uh, from a technology point of view, like, you know, Microsoft and all the technology vendor, uh, when we implement some kind of solution for um, uh, smart transportation, uh, there are some key solution that uh, normally we are working with customer, like, you know, uh, Based on um, IoT uh, platform, uh, cloud infrastructure, the data platform, and uh, um, and uh, new uh, new you know business model, we uh, we are seeing that there are some key solutions like you know uh, fare and toll management, traffic and chances management, flip and asset management like packing and also the data marketplace. Uh, this type you know the solution is not own the smart solution we can apply for 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 transportation like you know professor alec already mentioned in previous division so many uh research uh now in uh, in developed country like us and european but um in terms of you know, developing country like vietnam uh there are some you know potential sources that we are seeing that uh, we can apply for for vietnam uh to more detail like you know for fair and tone management um because of uh, when we apply uh, fair and tone management solution uh, for for uh, smart mobility, we can uh, have to reduce the congestion and optimize the um, the cost of traveling, and also we can uh, have the 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 um, uh, transportation authority they can uh, tracking um, the the vehicles on on the highway, for example, and so if they can apply some new technology like for payment, they can have. Uh, um, um, the driver can you know can pay I mean a payment with without cash and can save time. That's a uh, based on that the uh, public uh, service provider they can offer more incentive and more service for uh, for um, driver and for for for, for, for citizen and and so the for uh, using the uh, intelligent operation center and with the, the data they can collect uh, from the vehicle and so from 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 device I mean smartphone device from from uh, citizen when they're using the uh, transportation service uh, we can have you know real time uh, update about status of, of of transportation and so based on that with uh, with the um, uh, data analytic platform can help the uh, uh, service provider can analyze the trend uh, 
and also the status of, of transportation also give them in real time uh, monitoring about uh, transportation status in the city and give them uh, um, analyze uh, and predict the, the workload for city also and it can help to optimize in, in some of the city they can help have to in uh, to to optimize in terms of uh, uh, traffic light management uh, system and so integrate with the uh, incident uh, management system also uh, that could be you know the good for 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 um, different um, um, department of city can uh, can improve the the quality of uh, transportation and also the uh, for uh, fleet and asset management that the professor Alec already saw the video very interesting video before all right. Uh, we we can uh, use IoT sensor uh, on the vehicle, and so uh, with the with the data from the vehicle, the send to the uh, the system. The system can can collect the data and align and give them some some optimization solution in terms of uh, planning, uh, in terms of you know um, scheduling for the vehicle also, and tracking the the vehicle on on the highway and some uh, give them some uh, uh, shortest uh, plans. And and uh, especially with the uh, IoT um, platform and the sensor, they can collect the data from many equipment of the high, um, of the vehicle and also the, the, the system to uh, align and to give them some predictive maintenance uh, plan and uh, give them some uh, analysis in terms of uh, performance and 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 um, uh, uh, ally about you know the. The, the 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 minutes outcome of of the system uh um transportation system also. and uh, for the parking management right now we are working with some uh, customer uh, in smart city project to uh, um to study about you know parking uh, uh source so with a you know sensor uh in in the parking area we can detect the vehicle on a parking slot and to give them the real time about a variable slot and give them some give the driver some guidance to where the the, the best fit uh, portion for them in, in the parking and so the uh, another solution that they can uh, use as the, we um, implement some automatic uh, electric, um, payment machine uh, to give them um, to pay without cash and uh, using the mobile wireless also and um, and uh, um, also the, because of uh, uh, because of they can collect the real time data, they can uh, and depending on the status of uh, of transportation, uh, they can uh, adjust the pricing to uh, to give more. I mean, more incentive for 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 for, for driver. Uh, it's because of uh, uh, now the parking slot, they 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 can give a fixed price, but but with uh, you know near uh, near real time uh, analysis on about you know the workload and status, they can give. Give a dynamic price uh, um, parking rate instead of just a fixed uh, parking rate um, before. And uh, um, the last uh, uh, source, and I think, is very important. That's uh, uh, Professor, Professor Alec also mentioned before that uh, because of uh, not just only the uh, transportation service provider, uh, we should uh, we can you know build a you know very big ecosystem of uh, transportation service provider and. And we can collect data and analyze data. We can build a data marketplace, and so we can provide data for a third party uh, at a third party submit. And all the uh, other company they can use the data and develop uh, their own solution. So with the data marketplace, that's a we that's a platform that the city and 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 even with the, with the nation uh, platform that we can collect data uh, from the the vehicle and 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 um, and uh, transportation uh, infrastructure and then we can uh, uh, process the data we can uh, um, standardize the data and so that we can do some analytics and then we can expose the data as api data and public them and use and all the uh, stakeholder if they want to reuse the data uh, to make a new business model from the transportation data, they can use that you know open data API, and then they can provide back the uh, service for smart city infrastructure in terms of uh, uh, smart uh, smart mobility. So that are the key uh, sources now. That's a big big tech vendor like you know Microsoft and uh, other in Vietnam, and so even with some you know uh, big tech company in Vietnam, we are uh, working and we are. Uh, focusing in terms of uh, helping the, to uh, develop the smart uh, transportation in Vietnam. So
So that's that's a that's a my my uh, short presentation setting from uh, industry view. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ling and Tham, for your sharings. And also thank you to our panelists for their very uh, insightful contributions. Now, before we move on to other segments, I would like to just invite our panelists for a well-deserved break of just five minutes. And during this five minutes, in the meantime, we would like to invite you all to keep watch for a short tutorial video that will guide you through the process of submitting your nominations to the Vin Future Prize. Keep an eye out. Greetings from the Vin Future Prize. Please find instructions for the nominator following these steps. <coughs> to begin, you can access the nomination portal at online.vinfutureprize.org slash nomination. Alternatively, you can scan the QR code on the screen to open the nomination webpage. On this webpage, you can download the instructions and the endorsement letter template. In the instructions, you will find the complete nomination form where you can draft the nomination at your convenience. Afterwards, you can copy and paste draft into the online portal. Please click on sign up and upon successful registration, you can simply use your ID and password to log in. After logging in, please click here to start a new nomination form. Subsequently, you can see seven content tabs on the nomination form to begin the nomination process. On the first tab, please select the prize category as well as the type of nominee, whether it is an individual or a group of nominees. Then, click the Start button to proceed to the second tab, and we would like to draw your attention to tab number 5 and tab number 7. On tab number 5, your evaluation, you are invited to give your evaluation of the nominee's invention, including its groundbreaking discovery, scientific fundamental knowledge, specific approach, uniqueness, and advancement. Additionally, you are required to clarify if the invention can be transferred to a product and highlight its most significant socioeconomic impacts. This includes the number of beneficiaries, such as people, countries, and continents. Please explain how you believe this invention has or will potentially transform the everyday lives of millions, if not billions, of people. Next, please provide information on the history of the invention, such as when and how it started, and who else, except the nominee or nominees, was involved in initiating or contributing to the invention? About tab number seven, supporting documentation and evidence. There are several important documents that the nomination portal and form require. We would like to draw your attention to three critical items. The first one is the CV of your nominee or the CVs of your group of nominees if you are nominating a group of people. The second important item is the endorsement letter. Three endorsement letters are strongly encouraged, but one is mandatory. The third one is the additional form of nominees. Please provide as specific information as possible. Additionally, you are strongly encouraged to include any valid intellectual properties, publications, patents, or other supporting documents that provide evidence for the nomination. Finally, after filling out and providing all the content in the seven tabs, please click on the Submit button at the bottom of the page to submit your nomination. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most highly anticipated segments is now upon us, the Q&A segment. And during this session, we advise you, we highly advise you to use the raise hand function if you have any questions that you would like to directly interact with our panelists. And of course, if you prefer a more indirect approach, you can simply send in your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to assign them to a suitable panelist within our designated time frame. And now with that being said, we already received a question from a member of the audience and that is Dr. Lauren uh, Gawi, addressed to Professor Alexander Bayan. Uh, his question is, how can this setup be adapted to Vietnam? Some aspects are very favorable, such as the, availab the availability of GSM vehicles for sensing, but autonomous cars, even in mixed mode, seem uh, to be a remote possibility due to the specific challenges of Vietnamese urban traffic. 
Professor Bayan, could you help us please with this question? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dean uh, Elgawi, for the question. Um, so I feel that um, the first step towards an implementation is the freeway more than the city, because I think that uh, it's easier. And um, so specific to Vietnam, I think it would be really nice to find uh, places maybe around big cities which have these stop and go instabilities. Um, I think the next stage uh, is um, would be interesting would be to see if some of the VIN fast vehicles, for example, have uh, capabilities to connect to the urban infrastructure. Um, so the notion of V2I, where vehicles can start a talk to uh, traffic lights, um, is something which we're going to progressively see happen. Um, and because in some cities in Vietnam, the infrastructure is being developed or um, uh, some new cities are being built and therefore there is really an opportunity for new infrastructure. Um, the notion that we could have specific features that specific vehicles would have could be really attractive. Um, there's a really uh, common one that is used for transit vehicles. Like uh, I'm sure you've seen that in many cities in the world, in Germany, when the Straßenbahn, the trolley, uh, arrives at an intersection and can push a button that changes the light of the traffic light so it has the right of way. The same can be done with buses already. And maybe one day in the urban cities, it could be done uh, with vehicles as well. So I think for urban cities, um, the main difference with uh, freeway is that uh, the infrastructure has to be taken into account. And so this is something where um, uh, nobody has really done it other with, than with transit vehicles, uh, but maybe the VinFast um, vehicles have features that can enable that, uh, and maybe the network can also support it. Professor Bayan, thank you so much for your answers. Actually, there's a follow-up on that question as well from Dr. Nguyen Ngoc Zhuang. Uh, do we have Dr. Nguyen Ngoc Zhuang in the member of the audience? And uh, what kind of comments, what angles would you like to add in to uh, Dr. Gawi's uh, question? Okay. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Professor um, Alexander, for the very nice uh, presentation. So I just want to ask the questions uh, added to the question of Luang uh, that uh, uh, if we, we consider, like, we, for example, in Vietnam, especially in the big city like Hanoi, we have a mixed uh, vehicles, like including cars, motorbike, and uh, cars, we have a bus and, and, and small car, private car. So is that uh, possible sometimes to, to adapt to that situation like that in Vietnam or not? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the right, I think one possible approach is to tackle fleets. So you mentioned buses. Um, buses are very good because buses are heavy vehicles, so they're very yeah. good flow smoothers. Um, also, if you travel in a bus, you don't like big accelerations for comfort. So in some ways, the features required by the experience line up with the features required for uh, flow smoothing. Um, the next one that is to be... Um, motorbike. motorbike. Motor, uh, well, motorbikes... Okay, so motorbikes are hard to use as flow smoothers. So motorbikes in some way need to be smoothed. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, delivery vehicles um, are easier than personally owned vehicles to uh, smooth because you can mandate the drivers to follow specific regulations, which okay. exist already. So mm -hmm. in some ways, if you have buses, trucks, and delivery fleets, that might be enough to force the rest of the traffic to move smoother. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bayan, we actually would like to wrap up today's webinar by asking you one final question. Uh, urbanization is rapidly increasing worldwide. How can smart transportation solutions be made more accessible and affordable for cities with different levels of technological infrastructure? I would say it's a really good question and it's a really deep question. Um, and it's going to be hard to do uh, justice to the question in one or two minutes. But I think what's really important is that people have to realize that congestion is not a problem of people driving poorly. Congestion is a problem of imbalance between demand and supply. And when, since you're mentioning new cities, I think what's really important when you build a new cities a new city is that you calibrate the transportation network to the size of the population. Because if you do that right, um, then uh, everything that follows is much easier. And that's the difficulty in the US, right? They, they build the freeways and then they kept building the cities. So at some point, the population excess creates the problems. So in some ways, I think the number one step is to make sure that in the design of the city, 
um, the transportation network will always be able to support the demand. And at some point that might include um, regulating the number of people that live there and making sure that the, the, the density doesn't get too high. And then from there, you can design a system where, okay, you decide your modal split. So 33% uh, of the people will go by transit and 25% by car and 10% by motorbikes, et cetera. Um, and then try to, 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 to make sure that mobility access is equitable and um, uh, accessible at the same time. Um, but I think the key, if you have the luxury of designing the city, is to really make sure that the demand and the supplier are, are, are balanced. Because if they are not, then you have inefficiency. And then that's where I come in. In some ways, um, what we're doing is we're smoothing traffic because it's inefficient. But it would be so much better if it was designed in a way that is not inefficient. Well, thank you very much, Professor Bayan. And as we reach the conclusion of today's webinar, we wholeheartedly extend our gratitude to our chair, uh, Dr. Patmanaban Anandan, for being today's chair of the webinar. And of course, Professor Alexander Bayan, your very insightful and very profound insights has helped enrich our understanding upon the topic deliberated today. And of course, let's not overlook the importance of our representative of the Vietnamese scientific community, Dr. Linh Nhân Tâm, for joining with us. We also would like to say, uh, say thank you for, uh, to our audience for joining us today and for your engagement in the Q&A segment as well. Uh, once again, thank you all so much for joining with us and we are looking forward to seeing you at our next webinars. Thank you very much and goodbye.